everyone. Thanks for having me um, to talk today. So I am coming from Raleigh, North Carolina. This is my first time in London, which is a little exciting. So I'm based at North Carolina State University in Raleigh. We sort of have three Bs. I like to say we have baseball, basketball, and barbecue. So if you're ever in the area, uh, try to uh, enjoy them both either in the spring or winter. Um, and we do have one thing in common. This is our statue of Sir Walter Raleigh. And I found the London statue of Sir Walter Raleigh the other day over in Greenwich in the old uh, Royal Naval College. Uh, so just about seven and a half hours by flight apart, uh, we have this guy standing up uh, as kind of a namesake. But what I'm gonna talk about today is something very new in our lab and something I'd like to get feedback on and it's kind of preliminary. So that's why I sort of said toward sensing of adenovirus and adeno associated virus uh, and the work we're doing. I'll introduce viral vector manufacturing and why it's important to integrate sensing and analytical technologies into more of a, a manufacturing pipeline. So not point of care sensing for viruses, um, not from the medical perspective, but from the biomanufacturing and biotechnology perspective and what some of those challenges are. Um, how we're doing that type of sensing or construction work. <laughs> and then I'll kind of wrap it back up if we're okay. Uh, talking really about uh, the heart of biosensing and one of the reasons I wanted to present this here, which is discovery of maybe new bio recognition elements. So I'm sort of gonna talk a little bit in reverse and talk about the devices we built and some of the results, and then maybe how we're gonna loop back around and do some really fundamental research in bio recognition discovery that can lead to new uh, types of sensors. So to get started, we could sort of set the groundwork on, there we go. Um, what are viral vectors and what are we considering them? So we all know about viruses over the last few years and infectivity of viruses and the pathogenic form of viruses. But viral vectors are used sort of an array of techniques that go from uh, gene therapies, which is what we're concerned with. So think of delivering a virus that can actually replace a gene in the body, right? And some, in the case of monogenic diseases, this can in principle cure that disease. And so how do we produce new gene therapies and new viral vectors to deliver these genes efficiently and effectively? The specific virus that we're looking at now is adeno-associated virus. So if any of you are familiar with the Pfizer vaccine, that was an adenovirus. It's one class of viruses. Adeno-associated has some similar properties. It's a bit smaller, has a slightly um, different property aspect, which is really important, which is it's non-pathogenic. And it's highly specific to a series of different tissues in our body that it targets. So from skeletal muscle, neurons, vascular smooth muscle, and liver in terms of hepatocytes. So if you think of these systems and you think of the target for these systems, right, any of the diseases there, we can look at gene replacement. One of the issues in this space and the production in this space is how do we manufacture these viral vectors and these products? So one of the major issues is producing enough viral vector or enough product to reduce cost and actually deliver these therapies. To do this, we have to sort of analyze the entire bioprocess or bioreactor pipeline. And so right now, to give you an example, most companies are scrapping one or two out of every 10 batches due to a failure of unknown reasons. They just get a measurement at the end, either the quality is poor or the production amount is poor and they scrap it. So there's high value in monitoring what's going on in the reactors during production. And we're pretty good at a few areas of monitoring. One of them is sort of the old school conductometric resistance-based sensors, I'll call them old electrochemicals for dissolved gases, glucose, small molecule, and some basic optical sensors for fluid properties like turbidity and absorbance. What we're kind of bad at detecting in the concept of continuous or process flow is biomass evolution. So how are things changing? with respect to time and over time in the system. Product sampling, so how are we measuring the amount of product we're generating with a background of cellular byproducts, other DNA, other virus, other, for lack of a better term, junk or host cell proteins in the system? How do we do that in real time? And then there's product quality attributes. So not only the amount of product, but how good it is. There's modifications that can occur to the product. One of the big ones I'll mention is full versus empty. So you could generate a viral particle or a capsid that contains no genetic material. And so if you do just a count of total viral particles, you'll say I have 10, great. But if eight of them contain no genetic material, it's trash. And so this ends up being why we have to load 
or evaluate a lot of viral particle in a dose, and then this caused downstream problems. So product quality and product amount become really critical. Traditional bioreactors are giant sort of stainless steel or glass tanks, but things are moving towards mobile devices and bag-based systems. So this is a benchtop system on the left and a skid-based system where you actually can move around the bioreactor, right? And you can move this in either your plant or in a facility where you're doing sort of nimble manufacturing and maybe even made to order some degree gene therapies. When we transition to these types of devices, we need on-device analytics. We, we kind of don't want a core or central facility. So the idea is how do we monitor things in real time in one of these systems? So we can look at things like biomass evolution, so integrated and online optical systems that we wanna build into these mobile bioreactors. Product versus host cell proteins are basically products versus all the background biomolecules that could be in the system. Quality attributes and performance, full versus empty. Transduction efficiency, so will this load into the cell and deliver the gene and transduce the gene accordingly? And ultimately there's a unique opportunity for predictive modeling, real-time control, training databases. I won't get into the data side of this, but there's both a hard sensor data component that might be very interesting uh, to everyone here, which is how do I build a new sensor and that data inform something. There's also a soft sensor side, which is emerging, which is what are sensors already built into the process, right? So if you have a temperature controller, a flow controller, a mass in, mass out type controller, what can you garner from that information and maybe learn from that in your process when you couple it? So these all become very important. The main question that we started to look at and what I'm presenting here today and we submitted our paper on is really how many are there? And there's a lot of different terms you could see in the literature, variant virus, viral particles, capsids. Uh, they all have slightly different functional meaning. I'll use them to some degree interchangeably, but what we wanna know is in principle, the total number of complete viral particles. So that means they contain the genetic material and their whole capsules. And that's what we're trying to count. And that's what I mean when I say titer. The process that we initially started to develop for a biosensor was we have a flow through from our reactor or our pur purification. So this contains all our adena associated virus or AAVs. We're looking at serotype two. It's also gonna have all of our HCPs or host cell proteins, floating DNA, particulate, pieces of this stuff that didn't form correctly. These viruses form via self-assembly, so you'll get bits and pieces as well in the soup that you're collecting. What we wanna do is flow this over or across our biosensor. In this case, we're using an antibody recognition that's specific to the capsid protein on AAV2. And this is really a straightforward self-assembled monolayer on gold electrodes. So we have a DSP linked antibody, we backfill with a PEG anti-fouling agent, and we're just trying to collect the, uh, the viral particles right across the surface. We'll look at some modeling, very simple circuit modeling across this impedance measurement, and we look at our result, and we're gonna basically look at the charge transfer resistance, and I'll explain where that comes from. But that's the basic setup for the EIS sensor that we tried. EIS or electrochemical impedance spectroscopy. We've seen a little bit of talks about this. We saw the dielectric spectroscopy early on in one of the tutorials, and there's been a few posters that have been looking at impedance mapping across systems. What EIS is really providing is label-free detection, which is exciting. You're looking at surface change and charge changes on the electrode surface. We can potentially do real-time monitoring, how fast we can sweep our frequencies and record the impedance and do analysis. It is very sensitive, and I highlight this because it's both a good and a bad. So they can detect fairly low concentrations or surface changes uh, at your electrode interface. However, when we have a very complex media or non-specific binding to the surface, you're not gonna know whether that's your target or without some washing step uh, background noise. It's versatile in the sense that it could be adapted for detection of a lot of different things. So if we wanna multiplex and look at HCPs or host cell proteins and the virus or floating nucleic acids and DNA, we can all do this on there. And basically what we're getting out of our measurements is a plot of the real and imaginary components of impedance. And these are kind of informative of what this basic circuit model looks like. We have some charge transfer resistance. So how can you have redox reactions happening at the surface? And then this Warburg component, which depending on where you look in the literature is sort of a mystery component that is affected by diffusion of things into and out of the surface. And so we'll have diffusion of both the viral particles, but we'll also have diffusion of our redox couple, which I'll talk about in a second. 
So the type of electrical impedance spectroscopy that we're doing or initiated in this project was Faradaic, which means we're actually having charge transfer or a redox reaction between our electrode and the electrolyte. And we use potassium ferrocyanide in our case as our redox couple. And the way you can think about this is if the virus is coating the surface or bound to the surface, it's impeding diffusion and charge transfer of your redox couple and the electrode interface. And that'll be realized as an increase in your charge transfer resistance across the system. So we have an exchange of electrons in this case. So we know that we're specifically reading out the kinetics of that charge transfer process and not just a capacitive change or resistance change at the surface due to nonspecific binding. And then we can look at the frequency response that will tell us a little bit something about the kinetics of this reaction. And we know the kinetics of the charge transfer reaction for, in our case, potassium ferrocyanide, but you could use other um, redox mediators. And that's kind of the window that you're looking in to measure charge transfer. There's a second form of electrical impedance spectroscopy that's, I think, exciting because it removes the redox couple, but it becomes a little bit trickier in terms of modeling and understanding what's happening at your surface. And that's non-faradaic where you're strictly looking at the capacitive charging and discharging at the surface. So we don't need that redox probe, so we can just collect our sample or capture our sample at the surface, measure the impedance at the surface, drop the diffusion component off, and we basically have models of RC circuits at that interface. Looking at that model is really exciting because these viral particles, um, depending on full versus empty or surface modifications, will carry different charge and double layer, which affects the capacitance. So there's potential, I think, down the road to really look at, I'll call it higher order models of non-Faradaic measures of these viral vectors to see how they're interacting with the sensor. So before we get into the data, we're taking a V2 that's been generated in HEK by a triple transfection process, so our standard bioreactor. We're cleaning it up, we're passing it over our functionalized sensor, we're looking at the charge transfer resistance of this redox reporter and basically the charge transfer that's happening. We'll plot that out and look for the RCT value. And that's gonna give us hopefully some correlation to the titer or quantity of AV2 that's been captured on the surface of our sensor. But before we get to that, I will not show you the headache, but great effort that we went through in characterizing the surface of these electrodes but self-assembled monolayers, and it's becoming more and more common in the literature, are fairly, if not extremely, unstable. And so looking at long-term stabilization of these becomes very important and how to stabilize those surfaces. Some people are moving away from traditional gold thiol sort of linkage because the thermodynamics, things just wanna keep moving around. And as you bind to the surface, as you have non-specific binding to the surface, you could think of proteins kind of working their way into the self-assembled monolayer, you have rearrangement, and this is all gonna affect your impedance recordings or your measurements. This is very simply our DSP antibody ligand with our PEG, but this is just sitting in phosphate buffered saline over hours, and we basically see our control or our um, sort of stabilization curves over time. And so this is pulled out at four or five different frequencies. When we're closer to DC, right, because we have a lot of movement and you're basically looking at electrolyte getting to and from the surface at that point and rearrangement of the self-assembled monolayer, we go out to about 10 hours before we even see some stabilization, right? And so this becomes a major issue if you're prepping samples and holding samples, and especially if you want to do uh, non-Faraday impedance, because now your zero point is changing. So for all the samples, we waited 24 hours until a uh, buffer solution, so it was stabilized, and then we made all of our measurements. These are representative measurements of the AV2 binding. And so these are impedance curves. This sort of a zoomed in to the lower impedance region where we have the stereotypical S-curve. We don't get sort of that full semicircle. And we think that's due to some of the charge of the viral particle coming on. So there's some capacitive component and it's not strictly diffusive. And when we plot this up, we, we initially thought we saw very little response until higher titers. So 1e to the 12, 1e to the 13 um, titers of viral particles per milliliter. That's typically how this is measured. And for reference, it's a little bit difficult to go above 1e to 13. Your typical production value is around 1e to the 12. If you're getting that, it's really good for a product. 1e to 13 is sort of commercial standards, right? Where they push it pretty hard and they have a honed in system. When you start to concentrate beyond that, 
you have clumping and particle aggregation, and that causes kind of issues in the whole production and purification process. It's hard to get clean sample out. So we're a bit limited to this window. When we zoom in on that window, we have a decent linear response. We start to see higher variation at the higher concentrations. And when we look at that post facto, we start to see quite a bit of clumping and aggregation. And so we have these charged blobs, basically, of viral particles that are hitting the surface and causing pretty large variation and instability at the surface. So as we first started, we started seeing this biphasic response and high variance. So we had nothing up until about 1 into the 12, and then we had a sudden on, basically, of our sensor. And we tried to look a little bit deeper into the response. And between the initial submission of the paper and now, we did a few more replicates of our lower end titers, 1 into the 7 to 1 into the 12 type measurement. And what we started to look at was these are repeats of the data that we had initially published. So similarly high variance, but we have some response and then it tapers off at some lower levels. And what we're thinking is there is a potential maybe to start recording or amplifying um, at these very low concentrations of viral vector titer, which is important because we wanna know when the cells start producing the viral vector. And that's a key sort of determining point in the control of the bioreactor and control of the system and as well as the rate at which it's producing. So one of the things looking forward that we'd like to start working on are amplification methods. And this is where we're sort of taking an offshoot of EIS, where we're looking at surface potential changes and capacitive changes. And we started developing a fairly straightforward extended gate field effect transistor. So if you're not familiar with this, basically what it's doing is taking a working electrode that is functionalized similar to our EIS electrode, and we're making it the gate of a simple MOSFET transistor. And we now have a correlation between our drain current and our basically VGVS and VDVS of that system. And so the true voltage that is across the gate is now affected by capture or binding of the AV and the particle. And so this is very preliminary data that we collected in the last few weeks where we have drain current is proportional to capsid um, concentration. And these are at those lower concentrations. So we're basically amplifying our signal or that potential or capacitive change at the surface. And we start seeing this and we thought, oh, this is a great start. This is a bit cleaner, a bit more amplified system in the egg fit. And we could start measuring this and we want to measure EIS at the same time across that working electrode. And maybe we can start to decouple what's actually happening across the entire range of sensors. So we started to repeat this. Uh, and as mentioned, with all of these self-assembled monolayers, our variation went through the roof and we started having significant issues with the response and consistent response over this range. This, I think, is affected by both the fabrication techniques and the self-assembled monolayer and the stability of that, as well as moving across multiple concentrations and higher and higher titers of our vector. And one thing that we discovered that is becoming a confounding aspect of this is our reference electrode position became very important. And we're actually starting to map this out, which is as we moved around our reference electrode, we saw basically a bouncing VDVS, depending on where we moved it to. And then we fixed it back to the original point, And as expected, it went back to the same current as we started. So there's also a manufacturing hurdle that we ran into recently. So anyone working on some of these EGFET devices or extended gate devices, or any OECTs, organic electrochemical transistors, and you're thinking about reference electrode position relative to your working electrode, it does really, really matter. And how you're positioning and how you're setting up that experiment might have significant effects on these currents or this amplification across the system. So these are a couple steps and things we're working at that I like to show that we're trying to tweak, trying to tune, and things we're finding out, and hopefully will help. So at this point, coming in to sort of the biosensors meeting, we looked at these EIS-based sensors. We had stability and dynamic range issues. So these self-assembled monolayers and surface chemistries are, I think, poorly stable in the long run, and the reproducibility is, is tough. We had multiple students sort of work on it and develop them. And we see a similar trend, and we're very confident in the responses. But long-term stability, and especially storage stability, was negligible, if not really impractical for the type of setup that we were using. We'd like to avoid conjugated antibodies on the monolayer, so the larger recognition elements are harder to have good stability in the long run, right? They just have a tendency to move off and come off of the system, especially when you're continuously flowing or running in a more complex medium. 
So we wanna identify alternative recognition elements. We really wanna look at full versus empty. We think that's changing a lot of this uh, capacitance response as well as uh, even the Faradaic response and clumps of vectors that come in at the higher concentration. Hopefully we can move to non-Faradaic operation. We'll have to tune pH and ionic strength, which are a big portion of egg fed operation and what's happening at that surface. But ideally it can amplify and improve sensitivity at the lower titers. The key is to basically create a sensor or multiplexed sensor, even multimodal that's working across this dynamic range from zero up to one E to the 13th, which is the operating range for most of these reactors or productions. So to switch gears, as promised, the thing that we first started looking at and most recently started looking at was how do we control the stability and dynamic range by adjusting our surface chemistry and adjusting our biorecognition. And I want to present this as sort of biosensors. And when I think of the core, maybe traditional definition of biosensors having a recognition element or biorecognition element in the system, we're taking uh, cues from novel bioprocessing and I'll, I'll say what that means in a sec, to create novel biorecognition elements. And specifically, we're stealing from affinity chromatography or biotechnology bioprocessing tools, which are used to purify, basically target analytes from very complex media or very complex bioreactors. One of the most common areas of affinity chromatography, where you're essentially binding your target of interest on a chromatography column, is something like monoclonal antibody production and purification where you have to develop ligands that bind the antibody. Sometimes they're antibody, sometimes they're antibody fragment ligands, sometimes they're peptides, which we'll see, that will bind your target and have to bind it at fairly high affinity, but it also has to release the target, right? So if you bound all of your target drug to your chromatography column and couldn't get it off, you'd basically have nothing or you'd be delivering people chromatography columns that they'd have to hold on to or try to leach out materials from. So with continuous purification and viral vector purification, there's lots of work in process optimization, flexible optimization, and small footprint. So this was ideal for higher throughput screening. And basically what we're looking for is a small molecule. When I say small molecule, I mean peptide. So not an antibody or not a large protein ligand that will bind our viral vector and then release it at a certain condition. So I worked with Professor Stefan Managati at NC State in chemical engineering, who developed a screening method for looking for different ligand targets. And what this method is that we work through is we have some peptide functionalized beads. So these are chromatographic beads. It's functionalized with a random library or peptide sequences. We mix them with the AAV as well as host cell proteins and sort of known titers. And then what we're doing is we're looking at fluorescent binding to the surface. So we have a labeled AAV and a labeled host cell protein. And so the ones that just show up in red are ideal. The ones that are red and green means it binds a bit of everything. And if it just binds green, it would be good for chromatography because it would bind the junk in the system, but not particularly great for a recognition element for AAV. So we sorted out all the red beads. These red beads go into a little microfluidic system that we built that it images it and then either sorts it left or right, red is good, anything else is junk. And then we can sequence it's on the beads. And so by sequencing what was on the brightest beads, we can come up with a smaller down selection of peptide sequences that can then be modeled and tested in the system. So the first thing we do is we go back actually to an in silico model of looking at peptide binding to the viral capsid protein. This can be done across all the stereotypes now of AAV for the peptides we find. We're focusing on AAV2 specifically for this work. And we can see at different pHs, we can get different binding constants of the different peptides. And we can therefore screen or down select the peptides that we want. So through basically a library generation, similar to maybe Aptamer Selects, if people are familiar with that, we're generating a library. We're screening for binding, preferred binding to our target, not in general to the whole milieu of things in the solution. And then we can do a simple docking analysis to look at, okay, how and what conditions are best for binding. At pH 7.4, so our, our typical PBS buffer, we have nice binding for these peptides. And then we can run a screening of this system in which what these plots are showing in orange is flow through. So that means if I have the ligands present and I flow over my AAV solution, if the flow through number is high, it basically means nothing got captured and it came out the other end. 
So in the bioprocess world, that would be considered loss. So that's all your product that just gets flowed through the system and loss. In the case of the biosensor, it means it wasn't captured on the surface and therefore you're not sensing it. So high flow through is bad. So anything with a high orange is bad. So this sequence, actually, this is a commercial product. So I won't comment further on that, but not too great. And so these green are actually our eluted fractions. So that's what gets bound and then we wash off afterwards. So high green is good. And we selected a single peptide from this in this peptide sequence. We can do further analysis of the ideal components of the sequence and how they might impact or be relevant to different bindings. But this sequence seemed to work well. We can collect that at 80% binding in the elution. And one of the next steps we want to do is convert our monolayers to the peptide that we selected, and then look at both Faradaic and non-Faradaic and egg fed based sensing with that peptide now. We think this will improve stability, right? It might also improve some of our signals. So we don't have giant antibody capturing giant viral particle now. We actually have smaller peptide capturing large particle and the particles are main contributor to that surface capacitance and change. And ideally our hypothesis is that that's gonna improve sensitivity at the lower end of the concentration. Uh, and so we built out, um, we're working right now to build out these uh, electrodes and these sensors. And we build a lot of little mobile devices um, that's a little bit bigger than a US quarter. And so we have a small little egg fed circuit and an EIS circuit. And so ideally is to hook this up to one of the bag reactors and see if we can make these measurements uh, quasi real time. And so with that, I really just have to say thank you to a new initiative at NC State that I started with Stefano Minigotti uh, about a couple of years ago called NC Viral, which is our viral vector initiative in research and learning. It got me into this field of biotechnology and biomanufacturing and where sensors and analytics really fit in. Um, North Carolina happens to be a hub for gene therapy in terms of FDA and global approved gene therapies that are local located in the triangle. Um, one of the early AAV pioneers is located at UNC Chapel Hill. So we've, we've really had the benefit of linking up with lots of folks there who are producing uh, gene vectors and viral vectors at the very upstream portion. So they have what I would say, and I would make the argument, are potential cures, actual true cures for diseases. Um, getting them to scale and getting them to people is very difficult. And I think that's one of the area that biosensors, biomanufacturing, analytics come together. And we have a model where we're working through, which is sort of a foundry model, um, which is similar. We kind of modeled this off of semiconductor foundry where we have product definition and kits, and we're trying to help standardize this process of manufacturing. And where biosensors really fall in are the assay analytics and development. And you can think about it like metrology in the semiconductor industry. So if we have products rolling off the line or if we have standard kits or standard systems, how do we analyze them? How do we qualify them? How do we say, this is how much you made? And it's not just an at hand assay that has to go off to a clinical lab. And how do we get those feedback quickly? So we're building out those systems and this is the crew that's really doing it. This is Steph. I'll go visit him in Denmark after this meeting. He's working there. And this is the rest of the students that helped work on this. June was the first author of this paper who did all the EIS work. Eduardo made us our vectors along with Winning, who is over here. Uh, and Jack started working on the egg fets um, after this. So he was the ex post facto author on this. So with that, I think we have a little bit of time. I'd be happy to take any questions uh, or chat or get some comments and help on the stuff we're trying to do.